I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Seth Brown. He's a clinical associate professor from the University of Connecticut, and he's going to give us some coding advice for uh, coding in our specialty in 2021. Thank you, Seth, uh, for accepting uh, coming to Grand Rounds here at Stanford. And uh, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. I wish I could actually have come, but uh, <laughs> I guess this is the next best thing. And this is uh, Grand Rounds in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to talk about coding in 2021. Thank you so much for inviting me, Tulio. And so these are my disclosures, which um, you know, everyone in Hartford works for an insurance company. So both my wife and I technically work for insurance companies. And I'm gonna go through basics of coding, which is usually much more fun in grand rounds when I get to pimp the residents. And then I'm gonna go through coding in the office, a little bit about operating room coding, which is kind of a course in itself. And I'm gonna go through the code changes, which is super important because they're being released and applicable on January 1st. We're gonna talk a little bit about telemedicine, which is sort of our new world right now and go through a couple of the new codes, which are critical, including Latera and Eustachian tube dilation, and then talk briefly about how we use unlisted codes and when we use them. <clears throat> so usually this goes to the residents and I have them go through the abbreviations because they don't really understand what these terms are and what they, what they, they mean. But basically up on, on the screen, CPT and ICD-9 we use every single day. RVU, which we're gonna go through in, in a little bit, talks about relative value units. CMS is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And then of course, the most important abbreviation, which is UConn. And believe it or not, when I was a medical student on a way rotation, someone asked me where I was from and I said, UConn, and they said, the province. And I was like, no, not the province, the university. So the critical aspect of coding is in 2020 is documentation, right? If you didn't write it down, it didn't exist. But even more important is this term called medical necessity, which is meaning that if it's not necessary to do it, you can do a full head and neck exam, a full ENT exam. If that patient came in for cerumen impaction, you can't bill them at a high level, right? So the medical necessity really drives the coding and what we get reimbursed for it. And when we code, we need to take the CPT code and we need to match it to the ICD-10 code. And then sometimes we have to put modifiers on and modifiers are really important because it allows us to tell the insurance company something unique about the code. And most of us who do code feel that the physician codes and coders are really to assist us and help us because we know what we did. So how are codes valued? Codes are valued by RVUs, right? And RVUs are relative value units. There's three aspects of relative value units. And what they are, are the work, the work required. And we know this because this is what often a lot of the physicians get paid on. There's the practice expense, and that's what it costs us to do these code in the office or what they tell us it costs us to do. And then there's a malpractice risk inherent in each code. The code set's owned by the AMA and values change yearly. And they're constantly looking at different codes and changing them. So this is an example of a code. So this is 30117, which some people use for cryotherapy, and, um, but this is the code description. And so this is just an example of what we do. It has a value, which is the work RVU. So this work RVU for this code is 3.26. And then you get both a non-facility and facility practice expense. For some codes, these are the same. For sinus surgery, for instance, the, the practice expense is the same depending on the site, and doesn't matter on the site of service. But here, because there's a device involved, the non-facility practice expense is much higher. The facility practice expense is much lower. And the reason that is, is that the facility will charge their own fee. And that's the, called a facility uh, fee. And then there's gonna be your RVUs related to malpractice. So what you do is you take the work RVUs, you add your non-facility practice expense, you add the liability, and this gives you the total non-facility or total RVU. And then you also have your facility RVU, which is the adding of the other codes. And then they take that and they, they multiply it by the Medicare factor, which changes every year. And that gives you what Medicare pays. Now there's an adjustment for site of service. So out in, uh, the Bay State Bay Area, you guys get paid more than, than someone, let's say, in the middle of the country. And that makes sense, right? Then there's also facility pay if you did it in the hospital. Like I said, the hospital gets reimbursed by uh, their own facility charge. So what are modifiers? Modifiers are something you put on the code and it tells the insurance company something specific or unique about the code. Often they're used to prevent a code from getting rejected. For instance, if you're doing something during a global period or when you do a procedure in addition to a visit. We'll go through modifiers in a minute as well. 
So we lived in this ICD-9 world for a long, long time. ICD-9 had 18,000 codes and um, it was in use in the United States since 1979. And then a few years ago in 2015, we switched to ICD-10. So we went from 18,000 codes to 69,000 codes. And this was done to really increase complexity, allow us to communicate better with the insurance companies to track things for research. Um, and we, United States was kind of the last country to adopt uh, ICD-10. And there's a code for everything in ICD-10, right? This is the most interesting man in the world. And when he gets sucked into a jet engine, he uses a specific code. And he's actually from Brooklyn, but that's besides the point, even though he drinks those, those that case. ICD-10 has laterality. So when you code, it's always important to code to that last digit, right? So you can do H60.3, which says otitis externa, but you really need to get down to those digits to describe, is it the right ear? Is it the left ear? Is it bilateral? Some codes have this unspecified. Um, I can't believe that you can't tell if it's left or right, but there is an unspecified code. And some disease processes, for instance, sinus does not have laterality. And that's just strange. I don't know why that was created, but when there is laterality, super important to, to use that, right? You're communicating through this whole new code set and a whole new language. You can also code for infectious agents. So this is great because then you can track um, what's going on inside uh, your hospital, right? So what, what's causing your sinusitis? You can put in for strep or staph or MRSA, and there's codes for all these things. So what are my favorite ICD-10 codes? Because there's a whole lot of really cool codes in ICD-10. Spacecraft collision injuring occupant. Burn due to water skis on fire. Walked into lamppost, and you can actually have a subsequent encounter related to walking into the lamppost. Bizarre personal appearance, which most people would just say during COVID that came out of the woodworks. And then my all time favorite ICD 10 code problems in relationship with in laws. So, those of us who are married know all about that. It's important to try to use multiple codes. Like I said, coding is a language. So, not only are you increasing the complexity of your visit, but you're telling the insurance company about your patient. So a patient who comes in for sinusitis and you put the code rhinosinusitis is very different than the patient who comes in with rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps, asthma, diabetes. That's a far more complex patient. You need to manage their asthma. You need to decide, can you give them steroids? What are you gonna to do to their diabetes? Um, and so that patient is probably gonna be billed at a higher level. If you simply put chronic sinusitis, you're just telling the patient, the, the insurance company, hey, this patient came in for chronic sinusitis. If you add everything else, then you're telling this patient, you're telling the insurance company who this patient really is. So it's very important to include those comorbid conditions, the ones that are super relevant to the conditions you're treating. And so I typically will add asthma and diabetes and anything else that's relevant. If I have a patient with hypertension who comes in with a nosebleed, I'll add hypertension. I'll add if they're on anticoagulation. So what about when a new patient comes in, right? So when a new patient comes in, the presenting symptoms and the findings drive the visit, right? So that means if you basically just do more, you can't really bill more. It has to be that what they're coming in for and what you're finding is driving the level of coding. And the key here, and you're gonna see this in the new code sets, is complexity and decision-making is critical, which means ordering tests and further workup, reviewing things like CAT scans, discussing the patient with other healthcare providers and ordering prescription medication. So believe it or not, if you tell a patient to go buy omeprazole for their reflux, that's very different than giving them a prescription for omeprazole because now you're ordering a prescription medication, telling them to buy something over the counter does not count. Visit codes come in, through in three to five different levels. They come in levels one through five, and there's three different sets, a consult, a new patient, and an established patient. We'll go through all these. A new patient is one who has not been seen in three years. Um, and you can actually get a consult for a different complaint, but most people don't do this. So you can also consult a different ENT in the same group if different subspecialty, right? So if you're you're an otologist and you send your patient to a rhinologist, technically you can consult a different ENT. However, 
Medicare and most insurance companies do not recognize different subspecialties in ENT, even though we do have some boards in different subspecialties. So that's a hard one to get paid on, but technically you are allowed to do that. A consult is actually referred by another doctor for an opinion. So if they refer to you simply to take tonsils out, they're not a referring for an opinion. It's technically not a consult. The consult is actually uh, then evaluated by, your, by you and a note is generated to the referring doctor. More and more insurance companies are getting away with cons getting a, um, away from consult codes. So Medicare several years ago removed consult codes from their uh, allowance. So you cannot get a consult on a Medicare patient and most insurance companies have followed suit. Uh, some of the insurance companies like Anthem still allow consults. And then when you bill, billing is actually a bell-shaped curve. So if you go on the Academy website, you can actually go through Medicare data and you can look at what other people are billing and what levels they're billing. Basically, the top of the bell-shaped curve uh, or the middle of the bell-shaped curve is a level three patient. So the vast majority of our patients should be at a level three visit. If you are a subspecialist, you may have uh, more level four and five visits, but on, as a general ENT, most people live at level three. Level two complaints are relatively straightforward, right? A simple sore throat, a simple uh, cerumen impaction. Um, level fours generally have comorbidities or is a more complex condition where you're ordering workup. And level five are really life or limb type conditions. So these are your new cancer diagnosis. This is the patient that you're sending to the emergency room because you're worried about them. Um, gen level five, and what I do as a rhinologist is very rare. As a head and neck oncologist, that would be much more common. There's always this question about what's unilateral, what's bilateral, when can you bill twice? Most diagnostic procedures are bilateral codes, which means that if you do it on one side or both sides, you can only bill once. Technically, you're supposed to, and you do a nasal endoscopy, look at multiple different areas on both sides, and there's actually criteria for it but you just bill nasal endoscopy once. Likewise, laryngoscopy, you bill once. Most therapeutic codes are unilateral codes, which means you can bill them twice. You put a 50 modifier on and you get paid one and a half times. So for instance, debridement is a unilateral code. Putting an ear tube in, myringotomy is a, is a unilateral code. Controlling epistaxis, unilateral code. There are modifiers we use in the office, right? The typical modifiers I would use would be a 24, which is when you're in a global period, and I'll talk about global periods for, in a second, and you see something, you see a patient for something else. For instance, a patient had tonsillectomy, comes back in two months later, they're still in the global period for a nosebleed, right? That will be a separate visit, you put a 24 modifier. 25 modifier is something we use all, the day, all day long, and this is a, a code that's set up for abuse. So we're gonna talk about this one specifically. And um, this is when you put an e &M code on top of the office visit because you're doing a procedure, which is a separate procedure related to why you came in. And then a 79 modifier is typical when you put a, do a procedure during a global period of something else. So for instance, this would be if you did a sinus case with a septoplasty, the septoplasty puts you in a 90 day global period. The sinus surgery has a zero global period. If the patient comes in for debridement for the sinus aspect of the procedure, then you'll put a 79 modifier in the debridement to let the insurance company know, I know I'm in a global period, but what I'm doing is unrelated to the global period. So what is a global period? A global period, um, most surgeries will have a global period. That means all the post-op care during the global periods included. Patients cannot be billed for procedures or visits related to the surgery. And like I said, you can bill for an unrelated issue with the 24 or 79 modifier. And so the rule of thumb for global periods is in ENT, almost all endoscopic procedures are a zero day global period. There's some exceptions like a DCR or a um, endoscopic uh, orbital decompression have a 10 day global period. But most open procedures, you make an incision, a tonsillectomy, a neck dissection, a laryngectomy, these are 90 day global periods. So examples, office procedures, most of them are zero day global period. Sinus surgery, almost all is zero day global period. Ear tubes, 10 day global periods. And then things like septoplasty, tonsillectomy, neck surgery, all 90 day global periods. So what about office coding? Like I said, you can bill an office visit plus a procedure code if the procedure is not the only reason for the visit, right? So if a patient comes in to have their earwax clean and they're not a new patient, we're talking about a follow-up, then 
you cannot bill an office visit and the earwax removal because you're only, they're only coming in to have the earwax cleaned out. Likewise, if a patient comes in to monitor their inverted papilloma and their nose looks clear, there's nothing to do, there's no workup to do, they're basically coming in for the office procedure. You cannot bill the um, visit as well. But there are plenty of times in ENT that we're billing an office visit because there's work required in that office visit as well as a procedure. And that's when you use this 25 modifier. The key to the 25 modifier is determining whether it's significant. So does the complaint or problem stand alone as a billable service different than the procedure? Did you perform and document all the key components of the ENM service or the office visit? And if there's a different diagnosis, or is there a different diagnosis? Or if there is the same diagnosis, was extra work above and beyond the usual work associated with the procedure? So if a patient comes in and you spend five minutes with them, including a procedure, it is really hard to bill an office visit. An office visit for me in the sinus world is the patient comes in, I'm adjusting medications, I'm ordering CAT scans, I'm reviewing tests, I'm reviewing pathology, I'm making changes and doing things critical to this patient in addition to doing the scope. So often earwax, straightforward nosebleeds, um, straightforward nasal endoscopy for polyp checks, I don't bill an E&M. Don't bill an E&M for most of my sinus post-ops either. They're really coming in for debridement. Um, this is different for a new patient. If you've never seen the patient before, you do have to evaluate the patient. So if a patient comes in for something straightforward, and I have to do a procedure and I've never seen them before, I'll bill a very low level, like a level two visit, and then I'll bill the procedure as well. And the 25 modifier goes on the office visit, not on the procedure. So I really don't have time to go into surgical coding because that's just such a, a dense area. But in basic terms, when we think about surgical coding, you're gonna pick the code or often codes, if we do things like sinus surgery, we use multiple codes, that describe exactly what you do. Use the most specific code and do not unbundle. So in residency, we're taught to unbundle to make sure that we get credit for everything we're doing, right? So if you do a laryngectomy and neck dissection, you'll build a laryngectomy and then you'll separately bill the neck dissection. In the coding world, if there's a code that says laryngectomy and neck dissection, you have to use the code that says laryngectomy and neck dissection. You cannot unbundle and build the laryngectomy and the neck dissection separately. Right? So right now, there's some, in the last couple of years, sinus codes changed. There's actually a code that says sphenoethmoidectomy. You build a code that says sphenoethmoidectomy. You do not bill on the same side the sphenoidectomy and the ethmoidectomy. Right? That's what's called unbundling. It's not allowed. Some codes are unilateral, like sinus codes. And if you do that and you operate on both sides, you put what's called a 50 modifier. 50 modifier saying, I'm doing it on both sides. Typically, you'll get paid one and a half times for doing it twice. If there is not a code that describes exactly what you did, do not select what's called a like code. A like code is say, saying, well, it's sort of like what I did, but then you have to use what's called an unlisted code. So when in doubt, you can use an unlisted code and we'll go through how you build that and what you do later. And these are the surgical modifiers that we use. The typical ones I use are 50 for bilateral procedures. If I do a complex procedure, I'll add a 22 modifier. Typically that pays you 20% more. If I do a pituitary with my neurosurgical colleagues, I'll use this 62 modifier, the co-surgeon. Um, there's also a modifier that says, go back to the OR. And so for instance, although I said you have a 90 day global period for something like a tonsillectomy, if that patient has to go back to the operating room because they have a post tonsillectomy bleed, then you'll put a modifier, you will get paid for that secondary procedure. You just can't get paid for the routine post-operative care. So coding in 2020 is based on three different things. It's based on the history, how extensive a history that we do. It's based on the physical exam. And in ENT, for new patients, it's hard to get to level four because we often don't do heart and lung exams, which are required in 2020 to get to level four visit and it's determined by medical decision-making. And here's the take home of all of coding of 2021. As of 1121, codes will be based, this is office codes, on elements of medical decision-making only. What does that mean? It means that documentation 
is significantly decreased. In elements of deci medical decision-making, you have to meet two out of three different elements. What are those elements? They're the number and complexity of problems addressed. They're the amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. And it's the risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management. And we'll go through what this, what this actually means. And I'm sure your institution will give you a grid to help you. I'm sure it's actually on your electronic record system. Um, so what code changes happened in 2021? They eliminated new patient code CPT 99201. Well, we never used that one. That's really a nursing level uh, code. So they just eliminated that code. Like I said, um, history and physical only have to be done as medically appropriate. That doesn't mean don't get a history and don't do the physical exam. I still tell my residents, even though these code changes are coming, as a resident, you have to do a full head and neck exam on every single patient. You should get a good history and physical. But it means if that patient's coming back in just for otitis externa, you don't have to do the full exam. You have to examine their facial nerve, you have to examine their ear, right? And so that's where this is super helpful because we can do a focused exam in ENT when it's appropriate. Now we're gonna select the ENM visit, right? The visit code level based on either time, and we'll go over that, or medical decision-making. And in ENT, it's gonna be mostly on medical decision-making. There's a couple other things that happened. They changed what's called the prolonged services code. We'll go over that. And they increased RVUs for office visit. There's also an add-on code for continuity of care. And it remains to be seen how that's gonna be used in ENT. ENTs can use this code. It's an add-on code and we'll go over that real quickly. So like I said, still document in a, the medical appropriate history and physical exam. However, the extent of what you document is not an element in the selection of E&M service. So the question is, why did they do this, right? They did it simply because everyone moved to electronic medical record. And so what happens, you go into your electronic medical record, you go into Epic and you click all normal and it populates. So everyone has essentially the same exam and then you go in and you change a couple of things. And they know this. So they know that everyone's got these electronic record systems that tell them, oh, you can bill at a higher level, you've, you've hit all these elements, go back and do this one other part of the exam and you can get to a level four. And so they just eliminated it because it's all bogus, right? Um, the nature and extent of history is also, and physical exams determined by the treating provider, right? So you get to choose how much you do, you know, you still need to document for good medical care and you still need to document for medical le re legal reasons, but you don't necessarily have to put every single last thing in the chart. It makes the charts cleaner. It makes it easier for other people to read. So the, the straightforward codes, 99202 and 99212, um, these are minimal. One self-limiting or minor problem, patient comes in sore throat, there's nothing going on. Patient comes in for cerumen, patient comes in for just a minor complaint, level two, these should be five to 10% max of what you see. Still, 99203, 99213, um, low complexity. This is where most general ENT should live. Um, even a subspecialist, this should be at least 50% of your codes, right? This is the patient coming in for allergic rhinitis, chronic sinusitis without any comorbidities, um, basic otitis media, basic tonsillitis without comorbidities. These are two or more self limited or minor problems, one stable chronic illness, one acute uncomplicated illness or injury. Then we bump up to level four visits. Level four visits are moderate complexity visits. These are chronic illnesses with exacerbation, stable chronic illnesses of mul multiple stable chronic illnesses, a new undiagnosed problem with an uncertain prognosis that requires workup, an acute illness with systemic symptoms, or an acute complicated injury. And then we bump up to level five. And like I mentioned in rhinology, I rarely use level five, but um, a lot of ENTs, particularly head and neck oncology can use level five. These are really life or limbs, chronic illness with severe exacerbation or side effects of treatment. Right? So um, one acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily harm. 
So I always, I'm always asked, okay, so I build most of mine at level three. When should I be using level four? How do I get to level four? You get to level four by independent interpretation of a test, right? Performed by another physician. So if you're spending time with the patient reviewing scans and reading them yourself, um, discussion of management of the test or interpretation with external physicians on the same day of service. So if you're spending time reviewing your imaging on your cancer patient before the patient comes in. Prescription drug management. And I don't think you should be at a level four for, for drugs that are prescriptions that are also available over the counter that have low risk. Like if you're ordering a nasal steroid spray, if you're ordering a proton pump inhibitor, I mean, those are probably level three type stuff. But if there, if there are more complexity to it, if you're ordering antibiotics, if you're ordering steroids, um, then that's probably getting you to a level four visit. And then decision minor, uh, regarding surgery, pretty much most surgeries in ENT, uh, outside of cancer surgeries, relatively straightforward, but that should be a level four visit. You're discussing things that require risk and um, potential complications. Level five, like I said, really much more time and uh, labor intensive. You're discussing major elective surgery. You're discussing about sending the patient to the hospital. Um, this is a level five visit. So this is the RVU changes, right? And so like I said, nine, nine, so the only reason we have um, only new patients and follow-up visits is because consult codes are private payer dependent. They're not created by AMA or um, Medicare. So they're not actually published at this time. So we've eliminated 99201. As you can see, they've left 99202 alone. We've got an increase in RVUs in level three visits, right? Both level three and follow-up level three. And then we jump pretty significantly once we hit a level four visit, right? So this is a setup for fraud and abuse, right? We now increase the amount you're gonna get paid for a level four visit. And we've also relaxed the, what you need to do to get to a level four visit. So we have to be careful from an audit perspective and when you code, it really has to pass that sniff test, right? Does it make sense? Did I spend time with this patient? Is there real risk involved in what I'm doing? And then the level five visit, obviously much more complex, much higher value. value. And you can bill, bill on time, right? And so it used to be to get to a level four follow-up visit, it was 25 minutes. Now a level four follow-up visit is 30 minutes, right? So I often will book my, my pre-surgical visits as 30 minutes. And I wouldn't do a whole lot of exam, but I would bill this at a level four visit based on time because it was a 30 minute visit. Now I have to get over 30 minutes in order to do that. But here's the kicker, which is great. Um, I'm gonna get back to that. Basically now time used to include only face-to-face -face time with the patient. Time is now anything done for that patient on the date of service, including reviewing the records beforehand, reviewing the scan, discussing with other providers, ordering your medications, documenting, charting, uh, doing the paperwork. This is all now included. So, you know, with this, these surgical patients, if you're not getting to level three, which you, I mean, level four, which you probably are now because of medical decision-making, you can certainly build these things on time. If you have a new cancer diagnosis patient and you see them on the day you go to the tumor board, you can certainly build that time at tumor board as well. There are time codes if you go above and beyond the time requirements. So if you spend more than 74 minutes with a patient, which I do not, but if you ever spend 89 minutes with the patient, you can bill this extended services code, right? So you bill 99205 plus one and then an extended services code. And you can bill that on the, on the follow-up visits as well. But these are really, really long periods of time that you're spending with a patient. This is the add-on code I was talking about, G2211, uh, which is a HICPIC code. I'm not gonna bore you with that. That's just a whole nother level of complexity, but this was created to try to balance primary care with um, surgical specialties. It is a code used um, for continuous medical care and for chronic conditions. It has a small work hour RVUs. It's added on addition to the office visit I do not have guidance on when to use this or who should use this. I'm assuming in ENT, this is really gonna be for our surgical oncology um, colleagues who are basically spending significant time and energy managing patients and doing it longitudinally. 
So here's the whole kicker of the whole AMA coding changes. And this is what happens every time they change codes and every time they make major changes. They have to balance how much money is in the system. And so they increase the work RVUs on all these office visits. And the way they did that is to decrease the Medicare conversion factor. So the physician conversion factor used to be $36 per RVU, which means in 2020, for every one RVU, you get $36. So if you do a surgery that has 10 RVUs, you're getting $360 with a little bit of a fudge factor from uh, what region in the country you are. This is the first year that I'm aware of that they've actually decreased the conversion factor. If you notice in Congress, there's always a fight that um, at the last minute they save the Medicare system and the physician conversion factor goes up 1.5%. And everyone's happy. Um, this is the lowest rate um, since I've been in practice. I believe the 32 um, is the lowest rate since like 1992. So they're decreasing significant amount of money for our procedures. It's about a 10% reduction on every surgery you're going to do. In return, you're gonna get more money in the office and more money when you bill office visits. They say for ENT, this is gonna be positive 7% as a whole for the specialty. Um, it is going to hurt those of us who do a ton of procedures like rhinologists and laryngologists. Um, it'll help probably some general ENTs, maybe some pediatrics, um, and maybe head and neck surgeons who spend a lot of time seeing patients in the office, though it's gonna decrease their surgical uh, value. Um, so let's get into telemedicine. There was significant uh, activity on telemedicine. And as most of you probably are well aware, we went from very little telemedicine in ENT, we're not sure how we're gonna do this, to pretty much most of us March, April, May doing a whole lot of telemedicine and hopefully not, but it seems like probably coming back um, in the near future in the next couple of months uh, during the winter. CMS released guidance at the end of March, broadening access to telehealth. Almost all the private payers fell, followed suit. Um, they did this by uh, offering what's called a waiver. And um, it's intended to be available for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it should be available through 2021 and maybe beyond. And basically they're paying for virtual services in broader circumstances. And so now the patient could be anywhere in the country and at any site. We can pretty much be anywhere in the country or any site. So most of us did this from home. Uh, patient can be either new or established. We at my institution use HIPAA compliant platform, but you do not have to. You could actually do this on FaceTime. The NM code is chosen just on medical decision-making. You don't need to do any physical exam, which is obviously very challenging on a phone and payments based on the site of service, right? So whether you're an office or facility provider, and it does require some video uh, version because if it's not video, it's what's called a phone visit. You do have to document, like I said, bill based on medical decision-making or time. I'm not gonna go through the whole details um, and they've waived a whole lot of things on history and physical exam. If you bill on time, it's based on total provider time, which includes everything done on the state of service for that patient, including preparing for the visit. There are codes now for telephone calls. I've never billed for telephone calls in my practice, but um, some patients who are, don't have smartphones, can't get on the video, you can actually bill for uh, telephone visits. And these are all time-based. So you have to spend at least, I think 11 minutes with a patient to bill for a telephone call. So this is not, I'm just giving you your test result. Private payers, um, almost all of them have followed suit. I don't know a private payer around here that wasn't paying for telehealth. Okay, so let's go over these new codes. So the two big codes that came out, the first was Latera, and um, they were fighting for a long time to get their own code. This is not so they can do it in the OR, this is so you can do it in the office. So there's gonna be, so there's a work RVU of uh, almost three, which makes about sense, right? There is some work involved in putting a Loterra implant in, but there is going to be a practice expense and it hasn't been published yet, but there'll be two different practice expense. There'll be a small practice expense if you do it in the hospital or the surgical facility, because they'll charge their facility fee. And there'll be a much higher practice expense that should cover the cost of the device if you do this in the office. And I don't have the actual code number because it wasn't published, but it's in the, in the three zero family, which is the nasal uh, family. 
And then there was a new code that came out for eustachian tube dilation. There's actually two codes, whether you use it unilateral or bilateral. And that's the 69705 and the 69706. And the work RVUs are going to be 3 and 4.27. Again, there'll be also a practice expense RVU, much like when you do balloon dilation in the office, where you get a little bit of payment based on the work RVU and a huge amount of payment for the practice expense to cover the, the cost of the device. And I don't have these values yet. Before we were using unlisted code, and then you were using a HICPIC code for the device. There are also a few new codes on VEMP testing. Um, I don't get really involved in the audiology billing, but they removed a couple codes and they added a few more codes um, for audiology testing. And in the last um, five or 10 minutes, I do want to go over unlisted codes and how we use them because there's often a lot of confusion on unlisted codes and how you actually get reimbursed. So like I said, an unlisted code is when there's not a code that's exactly like the code that we're supposed to use, right? So if you have a like code, you're supposed to use what's called an unlisted code. And the way you do that is you select the CPT code that approximates the service provided. So if I'm doing endoscopic skull-based surgery, I will select the code or codes best describing how I would do this open. So it's typically a resection and an approach code that I would use. And I will compare my unlisted code and usually use an unlisted code by selecting the unlisted code in the surgical family that you're doing. So for sinus surgery, that's 31299. That's the endoscopic sinus unlisted code. And then you will use um, the comparison codes that describe what you do. Um, you're gonna write a letter stating what you did, why you used unlisted code and how it compares to the other code you choose. When you pre-authorize the code, typically the insurance companies will not pre-authorize the unlisted code. So what you should do is you pre-authorize the comparison codes. When I write my letter, I mentioned what procedure I did, the expertise that requires, the evidence supporting this, the time that it took to do the procedure, the risk it required, what it's similar to, and what reimbursement I want. I tell them what I want to get reimbursed. Now, they still may pay me almost nothing, and often I will fight for six months to get paid, but I don't let them set the code, um, the, the value of the work that I'm doing. I tell them how much work, how much risk, what this really required. And we know when we do say endoscopic skull-based surgery, sometimes these can be eight, nine hour cases and um, we wanna get reimbursed for that. So what do you do if you need help? Believe it or not, this was a real phone booth in my, in my hospital. Um, but now everyone has cell phones, so it's not really a, such a big deal. But um, I think I actually went faster. That's my New Yorker in me when I talk fast. Um, so I got plenty of times for questions and I don't know if Tulio, if we're going to use the chat, if that's the best way to do this, or people oh. just want to un unmute and just ask. Yeah, normally we can ask the questions via Perfect. the chat. So I'm going to stop share so that um, I can actually see people. Oh, I got a happy Hanukkah from somebody. That's for me. Happy Hanukkah. Oh, you know. hey, hey. Yeah, my kids were like, what if we go in the background with a happy Hanukkah sign? <laughs> I said, Please not. <laughs> so basically, you know, since I'm an old, old fart who's having to work at home because of my age and doing telehealth, I've been doing almost a duration of visit, including review of records and, and documenting in Epic. It ain't going to change that much for me, except... Now I have to justify the, the time difference that uh, the five or 10 minutes that they've added on. Basically, that's basically how that's gonna affect me. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, except it's not gonna really affect you because they have this telehealth waiver. So you're just gonna keep doing exactly what you're doing. But when you transition to the office, you're gonna essentially do the same thing you've been doing on telehealth, which is your billing based on medical decision-making. All right, I'm going now for dessert. Thank you. Hey, no problem. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Um, do you have any idea about, uh, you know, for a while at the beginning of COVID when we were doing telemedicine, 
they kind of let down the barrier and allowed people to practice across state lines, mm -hmm. but then they kind of put some more up. Do you have any ideas to like, if they're going to keep it like that or change it or what to expect? Yeah. So I wasn't aware about the barriers. The Medicare basically says you can be anywhere in the country. So maybe some of the private payers did that, but according to yeah. Medicare, you can treat a patient anywhere, right? So if you have, I mean, for instance, in Connecticut, we'll probably continue to use some telehealth because I have a whole lot of patients who go down to Florida in the winter. And, you know, what I normally do is I give them a list of ENTs in the area. Now I'm going to be like, listen, if you need me, I'll have like a half afternoon telehealth and then I'll go skiing. Right. So <laughs> there is that opportunity. And um, basically according to the law, and I don't see this changing with the new president, despite um, <laughs> I'm not going to get there, go there, but um, I assume that this is going to continue at least through the end of 2021. Are you guys back to telehealth? Or are you guys uh, still in person? No, we're we're full on in person. Same here. But we actually this coming week, um, a couple of our providers are going back to doing part time telehealth just because um, things are starting to shut down again here. Oh. Yeah. So Seth, we have a couple of questions. Uh... Great. Oh, okay. Let me look. So if you do nasal endoscopy after septoplasty to check for post-op adhesions, would you still use modifier 79? No. So the answer to that question is if you do a septoplasty, you have a 90-day global period, which means all the care that you do for that patient is included. So if you do a nasal endoscopy, you, you cannot bill for that, right? That's a zero charge visit. If you do a nasal endoscopy and let's say lice adhesions, that's probably still a, a no, uh, no charge or remove some crust. If you have to go in and do a drainage of a septal hematoma, um, then you can actually bill for that because you're doing above and beyond standard post-operative care. Um, you would not use the 79 modifier for that because the 79 modifier is saying um, that you're, it's not related to the procedure. You'd actually use a 58 modifier, which says staged or planned procedure. So that means, um, Technically, you're going back in, you know you're related to the modifier, but it's related to exactly what you did. If you take that patient back to the OR, I believe it's the 78 modifier, which says return to the OR. So you can get reimbursed for going back to the OR or doing work above and beyond what is standard post-operative care. But I scope all my nasal endoscopy, all, all my septoplasties um, at one week, usually two or three weeks, and then six weeks. And those are all no charge visits. Um, codes for thyroid cancer surgery will fully inadequate. <laughs> Eventually, such and do you have any advice this procedure? Um, so I had a, um, I had a, a mentor of mine when I was in, in residency and he basically said, you know, sometimes you go in and you do a neck dissection and you do a modified neck dissection and it, it's post radiated and it's scarred in and you're cutting it off the carotid and you get paid almost nothing for it. And sometimes you do these, these minor neck dissections related to thyroid cancer and you cherry pick some nodes and it takes you 15 minutes and you get paid the same thing. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Um, so the short answer is a more complex thyroid cancer, you can put a 22 modifier on it, which says more complex, took longer, you generally get 20% more. Um, I don't believe unless, unless, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on, on head neck cancer coding. I don't believe there's actually a code for central neck dissection. I thought you still have to use, um, the modified neck dissection code, and in which case you actually get quite re reimbursed pretty well. So, um, you know, if, that, if that's different, um, please correct me. Um, billing for the approach and doing ACDF. Okay. So again, with the, um, someone asked about the, um, uh, cervical approach um, for the neurosurgeon. There's, as, again, this may have changed, but my understanding was there was not a specific code for approach for an ACDF. And as a result, you're supposed to co-surge in that situation and put a 62 modifier in. So the, although the neurosurgeon is doing more of the work, um, it's a combined surgery. What a 62 modifier does, it bumps up the payment to 125%, and then you each split that payment, so you get about 62% or 67%, whatever it is, of that code, you get reimbursed. 
Um, so that's technically the way that's supposed to work out because there's not an approach code for the neck. Um, the neurosurgeons complain about that when they do. I tell them, well, when we do pituitary surgery, most of the time I do all the work and you just scoop out a tumor and then you leave and I have to put it back together. Um, so you win some, you lose some. If you guys have follow-up to any of those things, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Seth. It was a great uh, talk and uh, very informative. Sorry, I finished early. Usually I'm late. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sometimes thanks. you win some, sometimes you lose some. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Tulio, feel free to sh share my email um, or my cell phone. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm most of the time sitting around doing nothing during the pandemic. <laughs> Sounds good. Everybody hey, stay so safe and stay well.